There's no way. It's very interesting. You, you as a teenager, you can go. We don't have so many teenage abortions, but we have later in life. And there's almost free access to it, and it's very undramatical and so on. And, 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 and here, here. So these one down there are just going to replace those one up there. That's why the population will grow, you know. And, and let me go back here and, and show you. What is strange here is that, that if I take a country here like Vietnam, 1968, that came into this terrible war with, with the United States. Where do I have the United States? There. Huh? I take away the others. Huh? That was a Vietnam that had seven children per woman and lived 50 years, and the United States lived 70 years and had two and a half children per woman, and this is what happened. Here. Yeah. Vietnam is on par in the bedroom. <laughs> They're on par in the bedroom. They are, this axis, I regard this axis, and it fits in this school, this is bathroom and kitchen. You have water, you have soap, you have food on the kitchen table, you live 65 years. It's as easy as that. Huh? And, 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 and then you need the health service and the good public health to live better and live longer. Huh? But, but this is right. So they, they're, they are one generation behind. But the life expectancy in Vietnam today is longer than it was in the United States when Senator McCain came home from prison in Hanoi. And that's, that's no awareness. When I, when I presented, the, and this data is no, no doubt, they are good and they are confirmed, this aggregated data in Vietnam is confirmed by demographic sites and everything, there's, there's no doubt about this. Huh? And, and Vietnam doesn't have infectious and malnutrition deaths any longer, they have a lot of traffic death, they have cardiovascular death, they have mental health disorders, you name it, they have non-communicable diseases, the same disease pattern as the U.S. had when McCain came home, that's what they have today. And, and the challenge is, what is the difference? The difference is the living room and the garage and the garden. Because if I change this to money, and I put here income per person, Vietnam is there on $2,500. United States was there on almost 10 times. I have to take United States back, I have to take it back to civil war. <coughs> to Abraham Lincoln. That's where Vietnam is. Can you imagine being Minister of Health in Vietnam? You have the disease panorama of 1970, 1980, in West Europe and North America. You have the budget of 1880. And you have the technology of 2010. And people talk about human rights. And human rights are good on Sunday, or Monday you need a budget. There's no way you can provide the modern cancer drugs for them. There's no way you can uh, have, have, have the psychological care uh, w which exists. Huh? There's, there's absolutely no way. If China would provide the same health service as the Swedes get, their enormous foreign exchange reserve of four trillion US dollars would vanish in one and a half year. There's, there's so costly the good, the good health service. And that means that the Swedish health service costs more than the entire GDP per capita in Vietnam. And here we are calculating purchasing power parity. Two things you must learn. The difference between purchasing power parity and exchange rate, market exchange rate, M-E-R, huh? which is you go to Forex and you get that. You come from Vietnam with your dongs, you change it to pounds, and bah, panic, panic. Everything became three times as costly. Huh? You go from, from UK to Vietnam, hooray, your phone home is very cheap, I had a fantastic dinner, just a third of the price. Yeah? <coughs> so here, for health serve, for things done in the country, they are this rich. When it comes to importing technology, they are here. It's even bigger the gap. But they have managed to use all this knowledge, large part of it which was contributed from this school. Thank you for that. This has been a leading teaching. We don't like it. Huh? that you still build on all this colonial part and then you are so good. We really don't like it that much, but we recognize it. <laughs> you are damn good. <laughs> and that's useful. So, and we are also target that everyone else in the world had to try to catch up. Huh? And, 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 uh, and, and you have managed with this amazing thing that you have transformed what you are doing to the new needs of the world uh, and of England. I, I followed it over the decades. I'm quite impressed by the school, but I don't like it.
<laughs> I spent my life trying to compensate for the lack of colonial pass in Sweden. <laughs> So th this, is, this is more or less where they are. So what about the income distribution? If I, would, if I would look instead here of the income distribution, look here. I would, I would try to show you here the world income distribution. This is 1970. Here we have now $100 per year, $1,000 per year, $100,000 per year, uh, no, $10,000, $100,000, $10,000, $100,000. $100, now it's four zeros difference because this is households as unit instead of countries. Countries, it's two zeros difference. But households, it's worse. Yeah? And then Buffett and, and Gates, they are, they are over on that screen. <laughs> <laughs> but doing nice things with their money, you know. Whereas here, there's no one over here. People say the poor just get poorer, that's a lie. They can't get poorer. That's a cutoff which you had in your society at 100 years. Yeah? That's, that's actually here. This is, uh, this is Javier Sali Martin's income distributions of the world. Uh, and, and, and what has happened in the world is this. Uh, look here. There were still two humps in the 80s and the 90s, but they are merging. They are merging here. And this is where we have 2005. We don't have it any longer. We have billions of people. Here we still have poverty. The shame is that we still have one a half to one, one and a half billion people that are in and out of poverty all the time. The numbers hasn't changed that dramatically. The percentage have changed dramatically. And those who are out of poverty, they only come a little way here because this is, this is a, a third dollar a day, you know, this is three dollar a day. People have just come a little bit out of poverty. So they, they've come here, but they haven't reached you the welfare society where you can get free health service, and you can get free cesarean sections, and you can get free cancer treatment. That's over here. So uh, if, I, if I show then some countries instead here, let me take away the world. I go back to 1970. I go down here, and I take China rural, China urban. Huh? And I go down, and I take the United States of America. Uh, uh, of course, this is data with wide uncertainty. But sometimes the uncertainty in our head is even wider. So that's the only defense of you see. <laughs> 1971, the richer in the urban China, the nomenclatura of the Communist Party, lived like rural poor in Mississippi when it came to resources. Uh, and the, the people in the cities were distinctly better off than the rural areas. Rural China corresponded largely to what you saw in sub-Saharan Africa. Huh? And then this happened uh, wh when we go forward. Can you see? They get more people in the urban area, they move to the urban area, and the urban area move forward, but it's in the last year. Now they're coming. They're overlooking the United States here, you know. And they, they, they see now that 40% of U.S. families have a corresponding family in urban China with the same income. Yeah? And, and, and we all know what will happen very soon. The trailer was called Japan. The, the feature film is called China. Yeah? <laughs> but in some way, West Europe and this group that ethnically called themselves Western regarded Japan as an exception when it was showed what was to come. Uh, and, and, and here we now have, if I, if I put in here Congo, uh, if I put in Congo here, uh, uh, in Congo Democratic Republic, you can see the tragedy of the stagnant countries in Congo. Would I put Ghana, they would be here. Uh, the entire Ghana income distribution hides within rural China. There's no person in Ghana that has an income that, doesn't, that someone doesn't have in rural China. Africa is coming apart, sub-Saharan Africa now in different ways. <laughs> so what are the different health services you can provide at these different levels? I think we have been pretty bad at, at doing that. Now this is the new family in the world. I just have this here. Father and mother in Bangladesh, two daughters. He's going to earn money on this cycle rickshaw to get these daughters into education as high as he can. This, this, this is the typical family of the world. And mind you, many or even most of the Muslim countries have been more successful in family planning than the Christian. Just go and compare Indonesia and the Philippines. And, and, and you will see there's, there's no problem really. Iran, Islamic Republic of Iran, has fewer children per woman than Sweden today. 0.2 children fewer. Huh? 
I like Krishna, Krishna's work on the stages of progress, which is now overtaking, it's, it's I strongly recommend this book. Uh, where is it now? That was, that was my own book, which I not so strongly recommend. <laughs> Still, uh, still uh, want you to to take part. Of. Uh, it has such a, such an enormously good title, "One Illness Away." This is semi-quantitative interviews with thirty-five thousand poor households across all the continents, and what he finds is what takes people out of poverty are completely different things that throw them down. And if you bring 100 million people out of poverty, 75 falls back. It's an enormous flow out and in of poverty. And that's why the gold quarrel, should we have economic growth and opportunities and national credits, or should we have publicly funded health service and school which are free for everyone, is going to be answered with yes. We need the forces that take people out of poverty, and we need the protection that doesn't make them fall back into it. That is, it. the countries who manage with that, they manage to get away with, with poverty. And he has found that what people want first is food, then it's clothes, primary education, some little chicken and one goat perhaps or something more so they have a saving account of some kind then they're not poor any longer then they go on this is from kenya with cattle a better house secondary education they lease land then they get into prosperity when they get diary cattle and they buy land and they have a permanent house they start some business i think this is, this is a much more promising way of measuring poverty we need something similar for for health these people i've studied do they need, do they need uh, diagnosis of non-communicable diseases? Yes, part of rural Tanzania has the highest blood pressures in the world. Stroke is a major neurological killer in Tanzania today. Uh, um, hypertension is not a disease of affluence. Uh, it, it, the consequences of it is worse in affluence because you get other factors which create worse vascular <coughs> disease. This is about food. This is about America which is Thanksgiving. Somalia today is about food, then some water, the most crucial vaccinations. If you leave this level, you get into the vaccination. This is a younger version of myself treating these patients. Can you make the diagnosis? A woman 10 days after delivery with a very cynical smile. Tetanus, yes. This is Sardonicus. The sardonic smiles. He had one shot in the national campaign, but not a complete tetanus vaccination. That's why we managed in this hospital to save him. Uh, and, 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 and tetanus vaccination, everyone should get. Everyone should get the vaccination, the, the effective vaccinations in the low-income countries. Now, this is a middle-income country. This is Mr. Balam, Mrs. Balam in India, who had uh, kids who are gone to school now. And then she got weak with anemia, brought to a doctor, and with help of the money of the children, not so costly, she was diagnosed with chronic myeloid leukemia. She could afford the diagnosis, and there is a drug which is absolutely magnificent. And it's a drug that Noviartes did not by luck, but it was really this design drug, one successful de uh, development. And they need to get paid for that research, and they need to get paid for all the research that failed. So she can't afford it. What should the son and daughter say to their mother? Should they say, you know, mother, it's so good with this stimulation for the pharma factory that, that will develop drugs for the grandchildren, which are absolutely amazing. So now we'll give you some herbal tea and you can die. They can't pay it. They can't pay the price. With the old business model, it's impossible. And there's no one who has broken the law. Everyone has acted, acted as they should. And this is, not like, this is not like those bad drugs. This is a good drug, exactly what we want big pharma to do, not the antihypertension drug, which is a little better than the last one, and they want to have it. This is a breakthrough. 